Good evening. I'm Pete Berkowitz, and I'm the chairman of the Holocaust Museum Houston. And before we begin, there's a few things I need to share with you. So if you don't mind, just be patient for just a minute. First of all, though, and most importantly, I want to th thank the Montgomery's and Bridgeway Corporation for their generous underwriting of this event this evening. So thank you very much. And thank you, Ambassador DeVirgin, for, for the Baker Institute and your also support of this important uh, event this evening. Now, what I want to do is ask each and every one of you, please turn off your cell phones or noisemakers of whatever brand you have so that we will not be disturbed this evening. Now, uh, to continue on, uh, you have a survey form on your seat, and we would greatly appreciate it if you would fill out the survey form at the end of the uh, discussion this evening and give it back to the staff members so that we can address those issues that you think are important and comments on how we conduct these types of uh, events. And lastly, uh, at the end of the talk tonight, Samantha Power will be signing her books. They are on sale over there uh, for uh, 1950, but she will be signing books over here for those of you who wish to purchase. So thank you very much. And I think that's about all we have on <laughs> housekeeping affairs. But what I'd like to uh, tell you is just, as illustrated here this evening, we at Holocaust Museum Houston have been able to foster greater understanding and interaction among human beings through our outreach programs. However, each year brings new challenges. And for the world has yet to learn the terrible lessons of the Holocaust. Hatred, bigotry, and apathy are ever present. Today, some assert that the current genocide in Darfur is part of a Western plot to limit African leaders' freedom of action. In the face of such claims, human beings cannot apathetically respond simply by studying the situation. Indifference, as Elie Wiesel writes, is the epitome of evil. At the museum, we currently have two outstanding exhibits in addition to our permanent exhibit. The first is the Book of Fire, and that is filled with emotional experiences of the lives lost during the Holocaust. The second temporary exhibit is through the eyes of children, the Rwandan experience, an exhibition of photography by the children orphaned by the Rwandan genocide. In both periods of history, the world stood by indifferent to what was known, refusing to understand what was happening. Now I invite all of you to please come by the museum, see these exhibits, and for those of you who wish to join us and be members so that we may continue our programs, we would graciously welcome you into our family. So thank you very much. And now I would like to introduce the leader of the, I guess the chairman <laughs> of the Baker Institute, Ambassador DeRigi. Thank you very much and welcome to the Baker Institute and we're honored to uh, co-host this uh, event with the Holocaust uh, Museum. It's a personal privilege for me to introduce our distinguished speaker this evening, Samantha Power. She's a friend, she's a scholar, she has become an activist, some call her a human rights activist, her, one of her more recent uh, titles, but she's an activist, a person who has a passion for public policy and has the gift of the written word. Uh, those of you who have read her book, uh, the, A Problem from Hell, America and the Age of Genocide, uh, know that already. It is one of the best written books that I have ever seen on a seminal issue that 
has affected our times and affects our times and tragically will continue to affect our times. You have her biography uh, in your program notes and I'm not going to repeat in detail the many accomplishments of Samantha as a young person has already achieved in her life. Uh, her book, uh, The <clears throat> uh, Problem from Hell, uh, won the 2003 Pulitzer Prize for General Nonfiction and the National Book Critics Circle Award. Award. And it has had an impact in policy circles, I can tell you that. And because of its relevance and its objective analysis. She moved to our country from her native Ireland in the end of the 70s. She attended Yale University and Harvard Law School, and we forgive her for that because she didn't come to Rice. <coughs> She was a journalist for U.S. News and World Report and The Economist, and she was a member of the International Crisis Group that does very good work on uh, turmoil and conflict resolution throughout the world. Her article on the Rwandan genocide, Bystanders to Genocide, uh, appeared in the Atlantic Mon Monthly in 2001, and she has many other uh, articles to her credit. When you read a problem from hell. Samantha has opens up the book with a man who is truly a historic figure, Raphael Lemkin, a Polish Jew, who in the 1920s focused on a tragic history of the annihilation of over one million Armenian people by the Young Turk regime during World War I and who was struck by a comment by Winston Churchill that Samantha narrates in her book. Churchill, who referred to the extermination policies of Hitler's regime in World War II, saying, quote, we are in the presence of a crime without a name, unquote. At that point, Raphael Lemkin embarked on a personal crusade to search for a new word that would define this horrible phenomenon. The word that Lemkin settled on was, as Samantha narrates, a hybrid of gino, meaning race or tribe, and side, meaning killing. Genocide is the problem from hell that Samantha Power so brilliantly describes in her book. She also narrates that in August 1939, Adolf Hitler met with his military chiefs and delivered a notorious tutorial, as she says, on a central lesson of the recent past. He said, victors write the history books and declared that the aim of war is not to reach definite lines, but to annihilate the enemy physically. It is by this means that we, Hitler said, shall obtain the vital living space that we need. And then prophetically said, who today still speaks of the massacre of the Armenians? Forgetting the tragic lessons of history is a formula for repeating them. Up to today, when we are faced with the hell of genocide in Darfur, what more evidence do we need that this problem from hell is with us? Samantha Power's contribution to our knowledge could not be more timely. Our policy makers must take heed. Join me in welcoming this very important person, Samantha Powers, to the podium. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, in Texas, and I'm really grateful um, to the sponsors of this event, to the Montgomery's, to the ambassador, um, to the Holocaust Museum here. Uh, I've had a great day so far, interaction, interacting with uh, Houston's upstanders in the making, not their bystanders, but their upstanders, um, a group of about um, 50 or 60 teenagers plucked from all over the community who um, find genocide annoying. <laughs> 
and uh, and want it to go away and uh, seem pretty determined in their uh, lifetimes, which stretch in front of them um, to make that happen. Um, I'm, of course, uh, very grateful um, to the ambassador, who's been a great friend of this book uh, from the start. Um, I think uh, probably your support, um, I'm sure it stems largely from your um, public policy acumen and your vast numbers of years and your great proficiency in the foreign policy domain. But it also didn't hurt that you were an Armenian. <laughs> And uh, so I thought I would begin just by sharing a story um, about uh, the decision to include the Armenian genocide in the book, which was a very obvious one. The, the gentleman that you mentioned, Raphael Lemkin, who invented the word genocide, lost 49 members of his family in the Holocaust. Um, but even before the outbreak of the Second World War, he had been searching in his mind, his notebooks are filled with his efforts to come up with a word that was somehow commensurate with a crime that had plagued human history, you know, from Genesis <laughs> forward. And the crime that he was most influenced by, in fact, the most recent case of extermination, was that that had occurred in southeastern Europe or in Anatolia in the Ottoman Empire um, in 1915, 1916, the crime committed against the Armenians. So he had actually come up with a word, uh, barbarity, um, to describe the physical destruction of groups, and vandalism was the word he used to describe the destruction of churches and libraries and language and the sort of cultural destruction that tends to accompany the physical destruction or precede it. <clears throat> and he went um, to a, a law conference in 1933 to pitch his law and to pitch his words, to pitch this norm uh, that the, basically that would hold that the crime of barbarity and that of vandalism would be um, prohibited by European lawyers and statesmen, and that perhaps that would deter future Arminius. And he was pretty much laughed and yawned out of this uh, law conference, and they just said, ah, it's just, you're Jewish, it's all about the Jews, and you're just a just thinking about your own people and your own persecution. And, and he said, no, no, it's the Armenians, and it's the Huguenots, and it's the Mongols. And, it's, and um, they didn't take him seriously. The, the reaction of one statesman was, this crime that you describe, it takes place too seldom to legislate. That was the line. And that was 33. Uh, he went back to Poland. And of course, Hitler invaded Poland upon allegedly declaring, but after all, who remembers the Armenians? In other words, who now uh, remembers what was done to these uh, to this people? We can get away with extermination of the Jews in very much the same way that Turks got away with extermination of the Armenians. But I knew that including this case, because the recognition question in the United States, whether the Armenian genocide <coughs> should be recognized by the US government, whether it would ever be recognized by the Turkish government even all these years later, I, I, I worried that it would be a source of controversy and that I just, as here I was trying to tell a larger story about American foreign policy, about how we exclude, uh, as a structural matter, we exclude more often than not consideration of foreign life in our foreign policy. You know, we're, we're uh, a democracy uh, where leaders are elected to look out for American citizens. They're not elected to look out for foreign citizens and national interest has traditionally been conceived in a way that excludes consideration of human beings. So I had a bigger cause, and so I, I wondered whether I, you know, including the Armenian genocide would just get me, um, you know, take me down a garden path and 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 have me, you know, fighting fights um, that that seemed perhaps to to potentially distract us from the central uh, feature uh, of our foreign policy, which was tr I was trying to communicate through the lens of genocide. Um, but I included it because it was so central to the century, it was so central to Hitler's thinking, it was so central uh, to Lemkin and, and his decision to come up with this word, genocide. <clears throat> because after the Second World War, I should finish, round out the story, which the ambassador alluded to, um, but he convinced himself that if he'd only had a better word than barbarity and a better concept than barbarity and vandalism, that it would have been very different, that somehow the statesmen you know, at that law conference would have responded differently if, if there was just a stigma associated with the word. So he came up with genocide in 1941 and then propagated it into the 40s. 
But in any event, the amazing thing about uh, a problem from hell, about making my problem from hell your problem from hell, um, and traveling around the country and the world, talking about the ideas in this book and talking about bystanding as a subject for one of the first times, um, was that the only people who objected uh, to the inclusion of the Armenian genocide or, or tried to contest that, or whether it ranked, um, were uh, either Turkish Americans or individuals who had been sent by the Turkish embassy to hound me <laughs> as I traveled around the country. And, um, and I just thought I would share this vaguely uh, mortifying uh, thing that happened to me at the Holocaust Museum, since we're, um, I'm being sponsored here by the Houston Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, but I went in uh, after about three months on the road um, promoting this book and promoting the ideas, and this is pre-Pulitzer, this is, you know, church basement time, you know, it wouldn't be a crowd like the little, we'd have little brown bags and talk about the ideas in the book. And, um, but finally I had on the horizon an event at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, which I knew was my, was my crowd, it was my, my people. And, um, you know, I knew there was a lot of interest there and I expected there to be a great turnout. It was actually one of the, what I thought would be the, one of the final events on the book tour. And then the book got a second life and a third life and, you know, it was an amazing journey. Um, but I gave my talk and I'm funny. I'm a funny person. And uh, <laughs> no one laughed at anything. I know it's the Holocaust Museum. I understand that that it might seem a little strange, that, but, but when you're talking about policy, there's a lot to laugh about, as you may have gathered. Uh, lately especially, um, and a lot to cry about as well, of course. Um, but totally deadpan, just steely-eyed audience, nothing seemed to be working. There was just a, a lack of energy in the room. I thought I had my best game, and it was felt pretty much like a catastrophe. And uh, so then we got to the question and answer period, and um, one person, a young woman stood up and said, you know, and, and she characterized my argument perfectly. She said, you know, you talk about how individuals take refuge in a, in a, in a fog of, of plausible deniability, you know, because there's always some question about what the facts on the ground are when it comes to genocide. And you talk about systematic denial and you talk about a failure of the imagination. And she says, well, Professor, it seems to me you are guilty of all of these. And, um, and I was like, ooh, okay. And so then she really described how uh, wrong I was about the Armenians and what the Armenians had done to the Turks. And you know, so I said, fine, and I responded. And then uh, another person of a totally different profile, you know, small guy, very round guy, and I think probably no relation to this woman on the other side of the room says uh, the Armenians killed, killed my family in Van, and everything in this book um, that I have read is pure propaganda, pure Armenian propaganda, pure lies. So I responded and I tried to, you know, I did the best I could, but I wasn't having much luck, and then I took call of the third person. In any event, it was unbelievable. The entire Holocaust Museum was filled with people who had been sent, and they were all, I saw afterwards, they were all carrying Xerox copies of the first chapter of the book. Because initially, the only bright spot, I thought, to this true catastrophe, which was broadcast on C-SPAN. You, too, can, uh, my, one, my first television performance was probably, this was it. And uh, so I thought the bright spot, as I was sitting there, just sinking into the, into the ground, was um, at least all these people have had to buy the book. And uh, <laughs> At that time, it was twenty nine ninety five, you know, at, at a bookstore near you. But then I saw that it would, they all just had these Xerox copies of the chapter, so I realized. But anyway, it culminates in my despair. I did a terrible thing, which I shan't do on my next book tour if I'm put in a similar spot, which is that in my exasperation, I had already said, look, you know, I, I don't have a I didn't come to this with a dog in the fight. You know, I, I, um, I have, you know, consulted with the historical records as best I can. I spent six and a half years working on this book. Um, in my considered judgment, this is what inspired Raphael Lemkin to, to invent the word genocide. In my considered judgment, it absolutely meets the terms of the Genocide Convention, which Raphael Lemkin shepherded into law in the 1940s. Um, and you know, I'm not Armenian, and then here's where I made my mistake, and I said, I'm not Armenian, I don't have an Armenian boyfriend, I just am me. And uh, in the Turkish uh, 
daily newspaper the next day. It said, Harvard scholar, when asked why she included the lies about the Armenian genocide, could only answer, colon, quote, I don't have an Armenian boyfriend. <laughs> I don't know what possessed me. Uh, none of my even neutral C-SPAN watchers knew what possessed me. Uh, but I did get quite a few calls from the Armenian community uh, in the wake of, so that was the bright spot, I guess. Anyway, uh, I have never told that story, so it's all because we have a, uh, the ambassador here. Um, what I thought I would do today, because I know most of you are here um, with Genocide on the Mind, The Problem from Hell, little uh, program, and the, the cover, by the way, is meant to be uh, an American um, looking out from behind the curtain. It's sort of motivated, for me, was this whole enterprise was motivated a lot, actually, by the Kitty Genovese case in New York, where this uh, young woman was stabbed a huge number of times, A.M. Rosenthal's famous study of how many uh, people in, in, was it in Queens, I think, um, watched, look out from behind the curtains to see uh, this woman being stabbed and, and didn't call the police and didn't, you know, go outside and try to intervene. But I thought, since I know that we have genocide on the mind, and I very much want to uh, share more with you than my horrifying story about the Holocaust Museum, that we would talk about genocide, but also, crucially, uh, bring that discussion uh, to the present and talk about Iraq and the effect that Iraq has had and will have, inevitably, on future responses to mass atrocity and to genocide. Um, you know, as I said, to me, genocide in this book was very much a lens at getting at the nature of the bureaucracy that is in place, uh, tasked with tending to crises abroad, both of a national security kind, of an economic kind, and of a purely humanitarian kind. Genocide was a wonderfully damning way of isolating how our systems respond when mere values are at stake, when mere human beings are at stake. And many of the cases were those where national interests cut in favor of abetting a genocidal regime, as it, as it did when we were aligned with Saddam Hussein in 87, 1987-88 to some degree in World War I when we wanted to stay neutral in the war, our national interest cut in favor of uh, restraint and, and um, mutinous in the face of the slaughter of the Armenians. And of course, when our, uh, our politics uh, in the Second World War were such uh, initially where isolation and isolationism was the privileged uh, course, um, our national interests were not seen to cut in favor of drawing attention to the extermination of the Jews, never mind opening up immigration slots or bombing train tracks or leafleting the German people or any of the tools um, that we all now uh, wish were, were employed. So, but I, but I think genocide, I want to talk about genocide, but I also want to be clear that um, we can't start paying attention to what goes on on the earth when it rises to the level of genocide. I mean, for all of Lemkin's incredible virtues and an in, in incredibly prophetic way of, of seeing human history, I mean, learning from human history and applying the lessons, um, to some degree, you know, creating this crime atop the hierarchy of the horribles can blind us to the periods prior to reaching the red zone when actually for, at far less cost and with the expenditure of far fewer human and financial and military resources, uh, we could achieve a great deal as a, as a country or as a, as a global community. So the, to me, the, the, the key question is, how can we um, sort of transform the way our systems work such that foreign life, human life, rises within a system matters intrinsically as much as uh, U.S. national security or as much as economic standing um, for its own sake, but also because as we've gathered in recent years since 9-11, when um, people suffer abroad, often it comes back uh, to haunt us in a, in a range of ways, which, which again I'll talk about. So I just want to do basically three things. One, talk about the pattern of U.S. responses to the major genocides of the 20th century, again, which because I think they're reflective of larger patterns in, in the nature of governance. Two, talk about uh, the late 1990s and how things actually began to change and how norms uh, 
and popular perceptions of atrocity and of human rights began to change and how policies actually began to follow. Um, and then three, uh, talk about 9-11 and Iraq and how those two formative events by Iraq, I mean, of course, the war in Iraq, um, have uh, sort of interrupted uh, that vector at a very, very crucial and, and you could argue, um, kind of pivotal stage where we, it wasn't clear exactly the direction we were going in, but now there's been a, a drastic change of course. And then I'll conclude just by talking about what I think the lessons are and where we go from here, um, both in terms of correcting uh, course, uh, in terms of American foreign policy more generally, but, but also uh, how we can live in a world where mere genocide uh, without a nexus with national interest might in fact rise uh, within systems and command the attention of policymakers in the timely fashion that we all uh, wish had occurred in the past. So, um, first the pattern of, of uh, responses to genocide. I, I, as Ambassador suggested, I, I, I looked at the Armenian case, the Holocaust, um, the Khmer Rouge's slaughter of two million Cambodians, Saddam Hussein's uh, gassing and, and uh, massacres in northern Iraq in 1987-88 where around 300,000 people were, were killed. Um, the former Yugoslavia where I got my start as, a, as a, a cub reporter in the early 1990s. Rwanda which has gained almost iconic status as the singular uh, post-Holocaust uh, genocide. Um, the true kind of cold water in the face, you know, all the other ones you say, oh, was it genocide? Do we know? Is it, was it full on extermination? With Rwanda, there was no debate, um, there was no doubt, and uh, it was very, very quick. But of course, 800,000 people exterminated um, in 100 days. Um, so these were the cases that I examined. Um, the pattern uh, is as follows First, genocide happens. It will continue to happen. Um, I, perhaps this is, it will have to leave it to the teenagers that I met with today to have a different attitude about man's inhumanity to man and, and to have a, a more um, redemptive or hopeful um, uh, prognosis about the future. But given how long genocide and, and the effort to destroy the other, that phenomenon has been with us in human history, I would be very surprised if it weren't, if it didn't remain with us uh, throughout the 21st century. And I think one of the, the uh, aspects of the war in Iraq that is now uh, be being given somewhat short shrift in light of the debate about what we do, about getting out, about staying the course or cutting and running, the wonderful false dichotomy that has been presented to us as citizens, um, the, uh, the th one of the things that's been lost is that the violence now is genocidal violence. You know, when you stop at a checkpoint and you are identified as a Sunni uh, simply by virtue of your name or as a Shiite or you're changing your name in order to avoid that association and, um, and you are killed strictly on those grounds. Where a, and a, a very, and I think increasing uh, component of the violence that is part of the civil war that now racks Iraq is genocidal violence. Um, so we're seeing it again. I mean, we're not we're so overwhelmed by our own role and the blunders of the past and the and the and the fears for the future, both for Iraq and for us, that I think that aspect of it has been has been lost. But it, but there is a, a strong element now of genocidal violence in Iraq. It will be with us. So that's part of the pattern, unfortunately. Second part of the pattern is that, and I've alluded to this already, but genocide alone doesn't rise or hasn't risen within uh, U.S. governmental processes. Uh, it doesn't intrinsically um, command the attention of the heftiest policymakers uh, running the show in, in Washington. Now this was true, of course, back in 1915 when Ambassador Morgenthau, the U.S. ambassador uh, in Turkey, was, was uh, attempting to get permission to denounce the violence before military intervention. Nobody was thinking about intervening to stop it. But back then it was deemed a really big deal if you even condemned a government for its internal practices, if you even took note of their human rights abuses. Um, and he, he, Morgenthau couldn't, you know, get the ear, I mean, certainly not of the president, but even of the Secretary of State on this issue. Um, to the degree that he did, it was really almost just through the lens of somebody speaking out of school, would you shut the ambassador up? Doesn't he know the rules of how 
statesmanship is, is, is performed. Um, the best example, I think, of this more recently is during the Rwandan genocide, believe it or not, and I think this is actually probably the, 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 the most shocking aspect of the U.S., the Clinton administration's response to Rwanda, is that for the entire 100 days of that slaughter, when the New York Times was covering it, when the classified intelligence, some of which has been released through the Freedom of Information Act, when it all testified to what was going on, the President of the United States never gathered the principles in his foreign policy team to discuss what should be done. So not a single high-level meeting, and if you hear President Clinton talking about Rwanda, he, of course he always talks about it as the greatest uh, mistake or regret he has in his, in his presidency, which will, is saying something, uh, as, as some of you might remember. I mean, to say that that's his greatest regret uh, is a testament to where it has lodged uh, in him. Um, but one of the things he'll also say is, the thing I can't believe is we never even had a meeting. And it is amazing um, that, that, that the, just because it was Rwanda, it was in the wake of Somalia, but it wasn't a country that either that was intrinsically important from a national security or an economic perspective, or, and it wasn't a country that bordered a country that was important to us from a, from a self-interested standpoint. It never rose. It was handled at, at its highest level. It was really deputy assistant secretary level, which, you know, there's deputy assistant secretary, there's assistant secretary, there's undersecretary, there's secretary. And that's in the State Department, which itself, um, again, not to, is, you know, doesn't, wouldn't have the clout, uh, has had more clout then than it has today, certainly, but, but wouldn't itself necessarily be the place that you'd want planning, you know, for a military response anyway to occur. Um, so this is a, a, a fundamental feature that because no president has announced to his bureaucracy that this is a priority, the bureaucracy responds accordingly. In other words, the fix is in before the violence starts. Signals are sent to people about what matters to a president. I mean, President Bush, for instance, signaled quite early on in his presidency that HIV AIDS mattered to him by making this $15 billion announcement. Um, and what you see then is his calendar is structured in such a fashion that medical doctors from sub-Saharan Africa who come and are doing treatment get the meetings, philanthropists, um, people working on vaccines. You know, you signal with your priorities. And believe it or not, for all of the lamentations that have occurred with regard to the Holocaust, no American president um, entering the 21st century had ever really signaled to his foreign policy team or to the system as a whole uh, that this was a priority. And so when genocide strikes, the results are largely predictable. The third part of the pattern, um, which is also disturbing and very related to whether or not you have uh, very senior policymakers engaged on the question of genocide, is that when, when one thinks of responding to a foreign policy crisis of any kind, a humanitarian crisis, a proliferation crisis, uh, a war, a civil war, um, a border crisis somewhere, um, U.S. foreign policy professionals have at their disposal a vast range of, of, of tools that they can employ. It doesn't mean any of the tools will be uh, successful or that they will deter the practice that one is trying to, uh, to curb, um, uh, that it will change events, but it is a pretty diverse range. In the face of genocide, you could look at the potential responses by uh, democracies, by the United States, by Western uh, governments, um, as falling on a continuum from on the soft side, soft side of intervention, the kinds of things that Ambassador Morgenthau back in 1915 was trying to get permission to do. Just simple denunciation. You know, you, the Rwandan government, there you are, you're murdering the Tutsi, thou shalt stop. Use of the word genocide early if the facts uh, meet uh, the, the criteria or seem to meet the criteria. You could can probably never be foolproof in real time. Um, threatening of prosecution, an effort to mobilize a broader coalition of, of people, perhaps on the African continent, if we're talking about Rwanda, or in the United Nations to do the denunciation, to issue the demarches, to threaten prosecution. These are softer sanctions. These aren't requiring the expenditure of any resources other than words, naming of names. So not just a vague threat to prosecute, but an actual um, effort to gather the intelligence so you know who the bad guys are and you try to uh, th threaten them so they might actually, and, so, and you, let, you communicate to them that you know who they are, 
You mentioned perhaps their assets or their foreign bank accounts, travel bans. There are no fly zones conceivably you can put in place if, if um, you know, in the case of Darfur today, the Sudanese government is using its Antonovs and its Air Force to strafe uh, villages. It's already killed 400,000 people, uh, uh, supposedly, two or three million people displaced. And no fly zone is an example of a tool that they can be an arms embargo. Um, the creation of safe areas. We tried this in the 1990s. It wasn't a very pretty um, uh, experiment in the Balkans, but that had a lot to do with you know governments not being truly committed to protecting civilians. There is uh, one can imagine uh, the northern Iraq model uh, in the wake of the, the first Gulf War, where Kurds actually were um, uh, helped back to their homes as a result of the creation of a kind of, of a corridor initially and then a safe zone in northern Iraq where they were able to live patrolled from the skies. So we're moving toward you know, the more robust tools of intervention. And there are many who say, look, you know, when you're talking about when a government has already resorted to murdering, to systematically murdering the Armenians, the Tutsi, you know, Cambodian political enemies, the Kurds, the Bosnians, then you know, talk of radio jamming, you know, which is another tool that one might have used in the Rwanda case to sort of to get in the way of the genocidaires' effort to brand all of the Tutsi as cockroaches and to communicate the names and the addresses of the victims and radio jam, okay, it might get in the way, but you're going to meet the systematic slaughter of 800,000 people with radio jamming? It just, there's an incommensurability there. You're going to acknowledge that a genocide is underway and, and use the word? Well, that's Darfur, right? We've tried that, you know, where, where you, you see the, the, that the public is not satiated when all you do is give it a word, but don't actually follow up the word, don't treat the word as a trigger for a new way of thinking about the crime, for a new way of responding to the crime. So part of the reason this toolbox, which runs again from the soft forms of intervention to the much more robust kind, in terms of you know bombing from the, the skies as occurred in, in the Balkans and in Kosovo, or a full-on uh, military intervention, consensual, as in the case of East Timor, or uh, non-consensual, as in the case of Sierra Leone, um, uh, it's, a, it's a big toolbox. And what's amazing is in the face of genocide, for the most part, and there are exceptions, the toolbox stays shut. Shut! Where you don't even see the beginnings down that road. And it's precisely, I think, because of, of the, the, the fact that the issue doesn't rise within the system, so you don't get high-level leadership, and thus the path of, of least resistance in the government becomes the path of most resistance. You know, if you don't have somebody at a high level signaling that we should open the button, you know, do radio jamming, you just get a certain obstructionism and a fear, of course, that if you dip your toe in, your whole body will end up submerged. That, that you can't propose radio jamming. Well, what if then uh, you, you, you jam the radio and then it starts up again? You know, then your US credibility is at stake. It's not just a Rwandan problem. It's not just a, uh, you know, a colonial French or Belgian problem. No, it's an American problem once you've dipped your toe in. So the, the disposition of the system is to stay altogether removed. And so the, 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 I mean, the, the quality of the US response or the summation of the US response to the major genocide of the 20th century isn't non-intervention. It's that too. But it's non-involvement altogether. Now, the fourth aspect of the pattern, apart from um, the aspects that I've mentioned so far, and perhaps the most important, is that the governmental response has been, and the governmental quietude in the face of these crimes, has been abetted or ensconced in society-wide silence. It's been the very rare case of genocide that has actually brought about um, a political movement or that has um, generated enough noise domestically that policymakers feel that they may pay a political price for doing nothing about genocide. Now, the exception to this prior to Darfur, which I'll talk about, um, but was Bosnia, where partly because it was Europe, Europe and it was, you know, it was occurring in places we just had the Olympics. The Olympics was only eight years before concentration camps were again afoot in Europe. Um, its Europeanness also um, became, a, became a proxy for national interest, for a nexus with national interest. It was, you know, the heyday of the European Union, Maastricht Treaty. Um, European policymakers saw this as a blemish on the new unity that they were aspiring to advance. 
Um, NATO was at stake. I mean, after all, this was a crisis in Europe's backyard. There was a debate over whether, you know, when it was inside Europe, that wasn't supposed to be how NATO was meant to work. It was meant to be an attack on any member of the alliance, and Yugoslavia didn't fall into that category. But it was certainly a scar on things that were traditionally important to policymakers. So it wasn't mere genocide. And that helped um, both at, a, at getting senior policymakers very engaged from a very early stage, but also in igniting a domestic movement of the kind that hadn't been seen before in the United States in particular, but also to a lesser degree in Britain and France. And in this country, it was the columnists at the New York Times, Anthony Lewis and William Sapphire, never known for their great unity of perspective, um, but agreeing uh, that this uh, genocide shouldn't stand. Richard Pearl and Jean Kirkpatrick um, on the one hand, and George Soros and, and Arya Nair, the head of Helsinki Watch on the other, united over this, Jewish groups, human rights groups. There was a real uh, congressional uh, loud campaign to change the Clinton administration's response uh, to the horrors of Bosnia. And what that meant was the toolbox I mentioned was opened. And a lot of those tools uh, that I've discussed from, you know, denunciation and humanitarian aid, prosecution, no-fly zones, you saw uh, the Clinton administration reactively, but nonetheless importantly, moving along that continuum of intervention. Now, it took three and a half years, more than 200,000 people were killed in the meantime, but eventually that movement culminated um, in a military intervention that actually brought that war uh, to an end uh, in 1995. Um, but what you see in that counterexample is what's missing in all the other examples, that kind of vocal constituency, that impression being given to the President of the United States that there will be a domestic price to be paid for doing nothing about genocide. Bosnia was the one case, it was the exception that, that proved the rule. Now, what happened though, interestingly, after that intervention in Bosnia, and here's the, the, the second part of the talk, where you started to see genuine changes. And, and I was never in the uh, Francis Fukuyama camp of believing that history was, was uh, almost over. <laughs> and uh, you know the triumph of liberalism and the spread of, of, of democracy everywhere. But it was easy to, um, to become um, uh, inspired by changes and by institutional developments that we hadn't seen before. So I mentioned this, this movement. I mean, it was an ad hoc movement in the United States. It didn't, um, it didn't last beyond Bosnia. Everybody sort of came together uh, around that crisis, you know, which was you know, neocons who felt like America shouldn't um, be defied by a tin pot dictator in the Balkans to humanitarians who just saw um, you know, refugees on the move being ethnically cleansed and thought that was enough to Jewish groups who saw concentration camps again in Europe and just thought there but for the grace of God. Um, it was a movement that came and then it, and then it, it went. But it was a sign of something that was afoot um, in, in this country. And one of the things that happened in the wake of Rwanda, which didn't extract anything like that kind of movement, was that, as I indicated earlier, President Clinton came out and uh, four years after the genocide in Rwanda, and he said, I'm sorry. He didn't, he didn't exactly say, I'm sorry. He, he actually said, I didn't, he said to the Rwandans, he went to Kigali and he said, uh, it may surprise you, especially those of you who lost members of your family, but day after day after day, there were people like me, Clinton, not me, Samantha, um, sitting in offices who didn't understand the depth and the speed of the unimaginable terror which engulfed you. So after, you know, having lived the genocide, the genocide, the word genocide not being used, being deliberately avoided so as not to inflame public outrage in the United States, he went to Kigali and to some degree took responsibility for that. Now I happen to think that that was a, uh, I didn't inhale, I didn't have sexual relations with that woman kind of apology. I felt like it was splitting the difference. You know, he, he couldn't say, um, we didn't know, because you can't say that in 1998, 1994. Um, so he said, we, we, we didn't fully imagine, we couldn't fully imagine the depth and the speed of the horror that was engulfing you. Now, so I was a bit of a, an apology critic. But number one, it meant the world to the Rwandans. 
and, and this was a classic case of an Ivy League professor who should mind her own business and, and actually defer to what the people who had suffered the genocide, how they felt about the apology. They actually named the street from Kigali Center to the airport Clinton Boulevard as a result of this apology. No president had ever been to Rwanda, never mind come and apologized. In their mind, it was an apology. It was more than anybody had done up to that point. And Clinton is still, of course, revered in that country, largely because of the AIDS work he's done through his foundation since, but, but predicated on that wiping of the slate. Now that, you know, I was the president, and you know, I, I see that you suffered, and that I had a, you know, could have had a hand in, in helping you, and I failed you. Now, I mention that because that actually then created a space in the United States for officials within his cabinet and others to talk about how it is that we got Rwanda so wrong. Had the president debated it, you know, Somalia and, you know, the Republican Congress and, you know, what could we do anyway? Had he done what most people do in the wake of these kinds of crimes, there wouldn't have been this, I think, this societal consensus that Rwanda was a colossal screw up. And with that consensus, and then with the cultural explosion of attention to Rwanda, many of you I'm sure have seen the film Hotel Rwanda, which, which did more than any book or any article or you know, any probably um, you know, student movement to popularize um, you know, our guilt. I mean, basically to expand uh, the universe of people who saw Rwanda as a blemish on our foreign policy. So with all of that, and then with bystanding, you know, becoming a subject with a problem from hell, but others, many others are doing it as well, looking at sins of omission as well as sins of commission, you started to have a sense in political circles that, like a footstep effect, that if you don't do something, you actually might be remembered as well as if you do something and it goes terribly wrong. Um, you also had uh, institutional developments of the kind that nobody could have envisaged uh, in 1990, let's say, at the time of the first Gulf War, when the, when the wall fell in Berlin in, in 1989. You had the creation of International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia in The Hague. That quickly gave way to its poorer cousin, an International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which was created in 1994, the year following the Yugoslav Tribunal, when you suddenly had two tribunals in place and they shared a prosecutor and shared an appeals chamber then you began to hear talk of, well, why do we keep having to create these after the fact? Why don't we just have one court where you have a prosecutorial office and they can investigate crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, whenever it happens? Why do we have to keep making this up as we go along? Wouldn't we be better off, if we have any chance of deterring anybody, having a structure in place up front? And that, of course, gave rise over time uh, to the creation of the International Criminal Court, which the United States is not a part of, but which is ticking right along in The Hague, um, having major difficulties with enforcement, um, but nonetheless is in the midst of investigating crimes in Uganda, in Congo, in Darfur, um, and in the Ivory Coast. So you have courts. Nuremberg, you remember, was right after the Second World War, 45, 46. Almost 50 years it took to have another post-atrocity prosecution. With this guilt, with this na nascent political movement, with the birth of human rights programs around, around uh, the, the world, and crucially, with a new sense in the late 1990s that humanitarian intervention was actually doable, that it wasn't so risky, that yes, Somalia had happened, we used to call it after there was Vietnam, and there was the Vietnam Syndrome, and that was sort of washed away by the Persian Gulf War. Then Somalia occurred, and then you had what people used to call the Vietmalia syndrome, <laughs> which was the resurrection of the Vietnam syndrome compounded by a disdain for things African. So the Vietmalia syndrome took over. And then you had Rwanda and the guilt of that. Then you had Bosnia and an intervention that actually worked and where very few civilians were killed in the Balkans and no American or NATO pilots were killed in the prosecution of that intervention. So suddenly there was a sense of, well, maybe, maybe Somalia was a, a blip and just badly done. Maybe it doesn't have to be so hard. So suddenly you had the costs of doing nothing as a political matter. The political costs suddenly existed for the first time since the Holocaust. The risks of getting involved seemed much lower. And surprise, surprise, you saw three interventions um, in the tail end of the 20th century. One in Kosovo, quite controversial, but um, from the standpoint of Albanian welfare, effective. Um, that was in, in the spring of 1999. 
Then you had in the fall of 1990 an Australian-led intervention in East Timor after the Indonesians um, staged a referendum or allowed the Timorese to stage a referendum and then the, the Timorese voted for independence. The Indonesians went to burn the country down and the political pressure was such, the guilt over Rwanda and to a degree over the Balkans was such that it culminated in an intervention that was too late for uh, 2,000 people who were killed but in time for the rest of East Timor to be given its independence. And that was again, so NATO did it in Kosovo, Australian led in East Timor, and then in 2000 you had a British intervention in Sierra Leone when they were chopping people's hands off. That created arms and legs and, and all kinds of limbs. That created a major uh, political movement in Great Britain, uh, supported by the United States, by the Clinton administration, and you saw a relatively uh, cost-free intervention from the standpoint of the intervener in Sierra Leone and now a struggling uh, uh, democracy process that has, that has taken root in the wake of that intervention. So things are happening. You have courts, you have political movement, you have policymakers who are beginning to feel they'll be remembered if they do nothing about these crimes, and then you have 9-11. 9-11. Uh, so what happens with 9-11? Well, for a moment, and, and it was a pretty long moment, it looked as though, in fact, this would aid the cause of genocide prevention by aiding uh, the moral imagination of Americans who are able to look abroad now and say, my God, well, we've now been hit, we've been struck, we, uh, we know what it's like to go to work in the morning and, 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 you know, and, and have a family member not come home. You know, we've lived that reality. Maybe the fact that, I mean, that was 3,000 Americans, maybe the number of 800,000 Rwandans somehow could stick in people's minds in, in a new way. Moreover, you had the president, um, not immediately after 9-11, but within about six months, beginning to state something that in human rights circles had been obvious for some time, which was that the way a regime treats its own people is a decent predictor of the kind of partner it can be uh, to the United States in the long term. So when Saddam Hussein uh, uses gas, chemical weapons against the Kurds in northern Iraq in 87, 88, that was a pretty good indicator that he was not going to become a kinder, gentler dictator um, by virtue of a, a, of a partnership uh, with the United States, which was the logic at the time. Or it was at least an indicator that the old saw, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, um, which applied to Saddam Hussein because Iran was deemed the greater enemy in the neighborhood, but that that carried major risks. It may well be true. It may be true that the enemy of my enemy is useful for five minutes or even five years, but he's probably never gonna be your friend. And very, very important to keep that in mind. So there was a certain revisitation of the old realist um, orientation of American foreign policy, which did exclude often, more often than not, consideration of foreign life, consideration of internal human rights practices, which ranged from locking up journalists you know, to, um, you know, genocide. I mean, it was, it, you know, a whole range of internal practices were not deemed um, worthy of significant policy attention for a very, very long time. And so suddenly that was up for grabs again. You know, the, the hijackers, they came from, most of them, all but I think three of them came from Saudi Arabia and from Egypt, which were countries with which the United States was aligned. And it seemed increasingly as if um, those uh, abusive regimes that were abusive to their own people, that those people who were being abused, who felt the, the proverbial jackboot in the face, didn't just resent the government that was abusing them, but resented the sponsor or the backer of that government. And so we had to just be more careful now that there were asymmetric tools available to these elements. You know, when, when people who actually hated their governments and then hated us as a consequence or hated us independently, um, were increasingly able to find ways um, to punish uh, those that, that, that they uh, had long uh, perhaps resented. So it was a moment, and it was a moment where we look back on, on Bosnia, which had seemed to matter maybe in terms of European stability, maybe in terms of NATO, but it, we hadn't really seen it at the time as a potential long-term threat in the traditional sense. Um, the fact that, you know, again, at the time we were... Our logic, the logic of American foreign policy was if we can just keep it contained in Bosnia and have it not spill over into the further, into, this, into the rest of the Balkans, into Greece, into Turkey, you know, Macedonia, that whole mess down there, 
then, you know, that'll be a successful containment policy. But then we realize after 9-11 that bin Laden traveled throughout the 1990s on a Bosnian passport. That when you try to build a wall around really dangerous places, not only does extremis, do, does extremism flourish, um, but but in in the in the populations in the in the indigenous populations, but the nastiest elements from outside tend to find their way into these very very dangerous neighborhoods. So there was, I think, uh, learning that was happening. Um, it didn't bring with it, um, you know, linear, uh, you know, ennobling. Uh, consequences, but it did mean more money for foreign aid. It did mean a re-examination uh, of our policy, of course, in Afghanistan and our, our having turned our back on that uh, country. Um, it meant that we started to ask what alliances with abusive regimes meant for our security. Um, and when you combined all of that with that movement that was growing in the 1990s, you began to think that maybe there's a really strong national security case for integrating concern for foreign life in American foreign policy. And that was becoming mainstream. Um, and then came Iraq, <laughs> unfortunately. And um, now, and I'll just sort of cut to the chase because I want to make sure we have time for, for discussions. Now we have a lot of those same ideas floating around but we have a major problem. We have actually a set of problems. The first is um, that the United States, which I focus my work on because yeah, I do think um, uh, it is a country that has, uh, of course, committed its share of abuses during the Cold War and so on, but the one thing we do learn from responses to genocide is when the United States doesn't respond, the rest of the world is hardly clamoring to do the work uh, uh, on its own. The United States is the indispensable nation. So let me just go through what I take to be five consequences of the war in Iraq on the subject that we're talking about tonight, but on foreign policy more generally as well. The first is that um, US power, the United States, the superpower, um, is uh, waning. <laughs> uh, hard power isn't waning. We have. Our military budget is still greater than the, than the next 30 militaries combined. Our economy dwarfs that of China and India put together, the great engines of the economic dynamos and so on. But measuring power in terms of military and economic might is, a, is, is very 20th century. Um, it's really important to measure power, uh, I think not in those terms, although I think both of military and economic power matter, of course, a great deal. But the best way to judge our power is by our influence. And influence, as distinct from hard power, is, I think, um, is shaped by a number of factors besides hard power. And the two that I think are the most important are, and, and I think we're, we're seeing the, the erosion of US influence because of the uh, lack of consideration of these factors, but our, we have hard power, this is a component of influence, and then we have other people's perception that we're using our power properly, legitimacy. But crucially, and this is often forgotten by those pe people who think a lot about international law and international institutions, but I think this is just as important as the perception that the United States is acting illegitimately in places around the world, is the perception that we're not using our power competently. <laughs> and this competence factor, which is not just about Iraq, um, but it's as much about Katrina as it is about Iraq. It's as much about getting a window into how our systems respond for our own citizens as how we, we mucked up the planning uh, for uh, the, the war in Iraq. But this combination of the erosion of legitimacy, the erosion in per perceptions of competence, and an overstretch, of course, in terms of hard power, in terms of our military being very o overstretched, soldiers on their fourth tours, us now uh, having amassed an enormous deficit in part largely to, to, to pay for this war. Um, but what you see is it has led uh, different elements, unsavory elements around the world to test us more and more. And the measure of our influence is are we getting what we want in Iraq? Of course, no, we will after we get the ambassadors, uh, the, the, the Baker report when they give us all the, the silver bullet for how to get out of Iraq, <laughs> poor man. Um, uh, Iran. Are we getting what we want with Iran? Hardly, even having engaged now in a multilateral process. North Korea, a nuclear test. 
UN reform, some of the softer issues where the United States took, took, took genuine leadership. Whatever one thinks about John Bolton, um, if, if I had been, uh, I wouldn't have done UN reform like he's doing UN reform, but my proposals for how the UN should be fixed would look an awful lot like his. But we, we walk into an international setting now, we can't get what we want. If soft power is um, the ability to convince rather than to coerce, you know, the ability to make others want what we want, we're at a moment where plenty of people still want what we want, but they want to want what we don't want. <laughs> they want to want uh, the opposite. And, 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 and virtually every crisis or every institutional need that we have right now, when we go to try to extract uh, or to try to achieve our objectives, we, we are unsuccessful. And this is a new moment. This is a very new moment, certainly in my lifetime. Um, second feature of Iraq, um, uh, in, or the second feature of the post-Iraq world, let me say, is that the UN is in dire straits. So often when people get frustrated with American foreign policy, they say, oh, well, okay, that's America, but what about the UN? Well, as Richard Holbrook likes to say about the UN, um, blaming the UN for Rwanda or for Iraq, for that matter, is like blaming Madison Square Garden when the Knicks play badly. Um, it's a building. And into that building come 192 states who each bring their own perceptions of national interest and who aren't in the mood to play uh, with others at present. Uh, the polarization of the planet right now is an incredible impediment both to figuring out what on earth to do in the Middle East, either in the Israel-Palestine uh, conflict or in Iraq or with Iran. Um, there is great, great disunity um, within the international system right now. Whether you call it the UN or you just call it the world, um, there's an awful lot of tension out there and true suspicion toward US motives um, uh, when it comes to human rights and national security. Um, thirdly, uh, European governments are not stepping up to the plate uh, to tend to the commons. With the United States overstretched, with all of these regimes uh, testing uh, brazenly, I mean, for, for the president of Sudan to be standing up to the president of the United States, I mean, it's, it's an incredible moment right now where the, where the Sudanese are saying, no, we don't want peacekeepers, and that they can get away with that despite a UN Security Council resolution and despite Darfur actually mattering to some degree um, to the Bush administration. But that's the moment we're in, that even the president of Sudan can, can stand up to the United States in a way that would have been literally inconceivable before the war in Iraq. But at that moment, then, you need countries that do retain legitimacy, that aren't as overstretched militarily and economically, to step up and tend to the commons, whether that's tending to global warming or tending to HIV AIDS or tending to genocide prevention, um, or, or to cooperate in the, in the world of counterterrorism, you are not seeing um, uh, the kind of investment in European societies in the commons that we need when uh, the, no one right now is answering the 911 uh, because the United States is so distracted uh, across so many issues. Um, fourthly, there was a lot of hope that was held out um, in the 1990s about regional solutions to the kinds of crises that I've mentioned. And certainly, I think we have to uh, work in that direction because, again, with <laughs> democracies um, unlikely to ever get involved in dangerous places um, with any great eagerness unless they're, they perceive their national interest to be at stake, um, we're going to need regional solutions for, for regional problems, African solutions for African problems. But here's the great unfortunate reality, which is that um, African countries are no more likely to want to do these kinds of things than Western democracies. Um, I mean, to some degree, you can play on African pride, um, but you have policymakers in those countries who are entertaining the same cost-benefit analyses about what to do about Darfur, you know, what about the oil, what about relations with Sudan. I mean, they're going through processes very much like those that, that the U.S. government went through back in 1914, 1915 during the Armenian Genocide. Do we interfere in the sovereign affairs of, of a, or in the internal affairs of a sovereign state? So when we look around for help at a time that we are um, uh, distracted and, and not as legitimate as we once were, people aren't exactly clamoring uh, to the fore. And then fifth and final cost, and this I think is incredibly important to be, to be aware of, 
and people in the human rights community, I think sometimes that we're, we're, we're too insensitive to this reality. Um, but there is a, a real tendency now to throw baby out with bathwater and to say, oh, look, look at Iraq. This is a quagmire. This is perhaps the greatest, we were, the ambassador and I were talking about this beforehand, I think the greatest strategic blunder in the history of American foreign policy. He's still saying since Vietnam, but I'm going to convince him before the night is over that it's, <laughs> that we can go further back than that. I mean, in terms of the cost to other aspects of, of American foreign policy and the number of crises now that lie on the horizon in terms of national security, never mind uh, in terms of genocide and humanitarian issues. But instead of drawing the right lesson from Iraq, you know, namely that when you go into a country uh, without international uh, support, without international legitimacy, and you uh, predicate a war on what proved to be specious grounds, and you predicate a war, very, very importantly, on best case planning, where you do no worst case planning, or no bad case planning, or no not so good case planning, um, you uh, will end up uh, with no one to share the burden with on the back end, a greater burden uh, than you anticipated, almost inevitably. I mean, other people's societies are very, very complex. None of this is easy. And had the United States, had the, the Bush administration been um, paying attention to other nation-building experiments carried out by other countries um, while we were sitting out the 90s in some of these very dangerous places, it would have seen how complicated and how difficult um, these tasks are to perform, even under the best scenario where you go in for all the right reasons. But instead of actually isolating what it was about this way of going to war in this place at this time that has produced this disaster, the temptation now is to say, oh, um, when you get involved anywhere abroad, bad things happen, quagmires happen, you do more harm than good. And so we return now to, um, if it's not the Viet Malia syndrome that I mentioned early, but maybe it's the Viet, Viet Mok <laughs> syndrome. It's, it's Vietnam, it's Somalia, it's Iraq. Um, and it's going to have a profound effect on these questions of how we respond to genocide. A profound effect. Not just for the United States that, of course, will not be um, uh, engaging abroad uh, with boots on the ground anyplace else for a very long time, but in other countries where the, there is very little appetite to go and deal with genocide or mass atrocity or human rights abuses to begin with. And now what you do is you have the specter of this quagmire and, and a newfound and, and very hopefully healthy appreciation of how complex and how dangerous it, it is to be involved in other people's societies. I mean, this is not, this is an important lesson to learn and the ease with which East Timor was liberated, Kosovo uh, was liberated, Sierra Leone was rescued, you know, led to this, I mean, frankly, bizarre, uh, you know, cookie cutter idea that every place would be as easy as every other place. And, and needless to say, Iraq is a very uh, complex place. So I just want to close by saying um, that we, there was a vector, and it was going in a certain direction. The one aspect of that movement that I think remains in place is the kind of uh, domestic awareness that we now have of the consequences of ignoring foreign life in our foreign policy. I think if we pause and really reflect on Iraq, we will see that ir the, the war in Iraq was not the uh, culmination of a, of a humanitarian movement, um, you know, as the Bush administration has come to claim, you know, that it was a democratization effort and so on. That's not what Iraq was. So Iraq is not the rebuttal to those who wanted to do something about Rwanda. Iraq is a symptom of the very same features of American foreign policy that gave rise to Rwanda. Non-intervention in Rwanda and this kind of war in Iraq are actually the flip sides of the same coin. In both instances, it's, it's, it's human beings abroad not sufficiently factoring in to the crafting of American foreign policy, and in both cases at tremendous cost. Obviously, the Iraq uh, being much more costly to us, uh, Rwanda only costly to the Rwandans. But, but until we recognize that these are, are, are parallel problems and that Iraq in fact, you know, I mean, the danger now is that we just say, um, you know, that we, we throw baby out with bathwater and we, we say we can't even begin to look at other societies because this is what lies ahead when we do. That's point number one. Point two is 
we can't do the Bush administration in particular, but no subsequent U.S. government um, is going to be able to do morality a la carte in the way that we have gotten used to. And what do I mean by that? I mean, right now the Bush administration is showing more leadership on Darfur than any other country on the earth. But it, 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 our, our leaders believe that we can lead on Darfur, go into an international setting, demand rightly that the genocide stop and that UN peacekeepers be deployed, that we can do that in one breath, and that the next day or in the next breath, we can argue for waterboarding. Uh, as, and, and for the disavowal of the Geneva Conventions. This doesn't work in a globalized world. It, it, it's not even about hypocrisy and double standards. It sounds to the naked ear abroad just absurd to be against genocide and for certain forms of coercive interrogation, however one splits hairs on that. So um, it's going to be very, very difficult for us to be at the helm of moral questions like genocide prevention until we shore up our house and recognize the connection that people are making, you know, in a, in a globalized world where everything is visible um, to everything else. And then thirdly, and finally, um, the, um, you know, we have, I, I think the 90s showed you and the Darfur movement in this country, which maybe we can talk about in, in, in the discussion or after whatever, but have shown us that, um, American citizens are acting on what I think is the lesson of the 20th century. Students are acting on it, Jewish groups are acting on it, human rights groups, African American. I mean, it's amazing the number of people who have come together looking at the 1990s and saying, oh, okay, well, if the lesson of the 90s is the only way to get our policymakers to take genocide seriously is to make noise, then we better make noise. And virtually everything that has come out of the Bush administration on Darfur has come about because of the activism of Americans, because 80,000 people gather on the mall, because you get more letters on Darfur than you do on just about any other uh, issue in foreign policy other than Iraq. I mean, it's incredible that with Iraq going on, with Guantanamo, with terror, that Americans have made time for uh, Darfur. We gotta keep that up, for sure, and, and, and take uh, leaders to task. But a much more efficient, way to actually see genocide prevention advanced is actually for us to elect somebody who makes genocide prevention uh, a priority. And so I'll just close by saying that I hope Barack Obama runs for president. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Samantha. Uh, you can see I have a fistful of uh, questions here, and uh, we don't have enough time to get through all of them. I'm going to have to categorize them. Just like the letters on Darfur, Samantha, most the bulk of the questions we receive from the audience are on Darfur. And uh, uh, fundamentally, the questions, if I can summarize them, is uh, what should the United States do that it may not be doing? to end the genocide in Darfur. Uh, one questioner says, recently President Bush spoke directly to the people of Darfur at the UN General Assembly, stating that the UN must act in Darfur despite Khartoum's refusal to allow UN peacekeepers in. What kind of action do you recommend the United States do in this circumstance? And it's all a variation on a, a theme of your, what tools should we use in Darfur? Um, uh, should the United States take a more active role, et cetera? Okay. Um, well, thanks for the questions. And again, they were reflective of this incredible thing that I do think is afoot. And for all of the depressing content <laughs> of my talk, I mean, um, it's, it, it's an amazing thing. It's not something that I think um, any of us, um, you know, who lived through the, the Balkans or lived through Rwanda, you know, and, and felt so disappointed and so isolated, I don't think any of us would have imagined the kind of um, strength um, that lay out there, just ready to be tapped. Um, and uh, as I s suggested, the steps that have been taken so far, um, the deployment of the African Union force, inadequate though it is, the referral of the crimes in Darfur to the International Criminal Court, the Bush administration's decision to go along with that, which given its position on the ICC was, was not at all inevitable. The U.S. funding of, um, you know, now going on $2 billion worth of, of humanitarian aid for those 3 million people who've been displaced. Uh, 
uh, the use of the word genocide, et cetera, the peace process that gave rise to, a, I think, a lousy agreement, but nonetheless, high-level engagement um, uh, by the Deputy Secretary of State, five trips to the regions, not something any Deputy Secretary of State has ever done in the face of genocide before. So things were happening, and they were all coming as a result of this pressure. The, the Bush administration would like nothing more, even now, than to cooperate with Sudan on counterterrorism, for the sanctions to be lifted so that the oil uh, would not only be extracted by Chinese and, and French companies as it currently is being. So, so what do we do now with this pressure at this moment when Sudan has thumbed its nose uh, at the United States, but also at the rest of the Security Council, which went along with the U.S. resolution calling for 22,000 peacekeepers? Um, unfortunately, <laughs> um, no uh, member state of the United Nations is going to uh, contribute troops to make war for Darfur. And this, again, is one of these facts of life that I think grow out of Iraq. It's one, Darfur is a, is a casualty of Iraq. You, you, when you talk about peacekeeping in Darfur, you see the collateral damage of the war in Iraq, um, because this is what is invoked in domestic debates in European countries and in middle powers like Canada, Japan, Jordan, Turkey. Iraq is, is what is in it. No, no uh, country is ready to make war. Now, that's the very, um, I mean, you could say it's good news or bad news that, that Iraq has chastened people on, on war. It's certainly not going to bring rescue to the people of Darfur uh, if no one comes in to offer protection. The good news is that uh, we are one Sudanese yes away um, from having a peacekeeping force uh, deployed in Darfur. And what's so unfortunate is that the Bush administration, despite pushing the right thing, namely this force, it has done none of the diplomacy behind the scenes to make it likely that Sudan will feel isolated, so isolated that it has no choice but to invite this force in. Um, Condi Rice went to New York and had a meeting of Security Council ambassadors and said, you know, we want this force to go in. But, you know, of course, because Darfur is something that has emerged in the policy process reactively because of your movement, because of people in the country signaling that it matters, rather than because of top-down regard, you know, by policymakers, the administration tends to do just enough to cater to the noise but not enough to actually um, put resources on the line to make something happen. So if Rice were serious, you would see trips to Beijing, trips to Cairo, trips to Amman, the kind of delicate diplomacy that is not this administration's strong suit um, uh, anyway, but, but nonetheless, when it comes to peeling away Sudan's allies, is indispensable. And so short of that, and it doesn't seem to be happening, and, and it's a very hard thing to advocate for. It's very hard for advocates to be like, mm, peel away Sudan's allies, uh, do that. Uh, it doesn't make for great billboards. Um, but ultimately, that, unfortunately, it's not, it's not a sexy answer, it's not a clean answer, but it's, it's what's needed. It is The United States is the one country that seems to care about Darfur because of the, the domestic pressure. Um, and yet its way of responding has been to show up and not to do that diplomacy. So the other possibility, and again, it's not very attractive, but is that another country, um, preferably a country like South Africa or Jordan or Turkey, a middle power with greater standing uh, on the continent of Africa in general, but specifically uh, in Sudan, needs to step up and be at the helm. Uh, Rice brought in Denmark as her co-chair of this meeting in New York uh, while the, the heads of state were here for the General Assembly. But Denmark doesn't buy you much in the developing world where uh, the clash of civilizations in the eyes of many is real. Um, and so that's the second scenario. And then the third scenario, also uh, very unfortunate, is probably because of the, uh, uh, the degree to which Bashir, the president of Sudan, has stepped out and said under no circumstances, over my dead body, colonial, Zionist plot for UN peacekeepers, one is probably gonna have to come up with a, a third course, which is basically a 22,000 person force, or hopefully a force of somewhere much greater than the 9,000 AU peacekeepers who were there from non-African countries but perhaps from African countries and Muslim countries, um, 
and you may not, you, we may have to run it outside the UN so that the funding stream is reliable, and which is what makes a UN peacekeeping force attractive, is that you know, you, it, the payment is done by assessments. You don't have to, it's not a stopgap as the AU is. Um, so you get sort of the perks of the, the UN peacekeeping deployment of, of a reliable funding source of more coherent command and control and, and of non-African troops, but you call it something else. Uh, I don't see how Bashir, even if you get developing world leadership on this question, will be uh, pulled off the edge of his branch where he's standing stubbornly. Um, and it, fourthly, it has to be tied to a political process. The Darfur Peace Agreement um, is, is at this point not worth the paper it's written on. Uh, the rebel groups that were excluded from that, that chose to exclude themselves, have to be re-enlisted. And maybe that discussion about a protection force um, is going to have to coincide with the re-energizing of that political process. I was hugely disappointed um, in the Bush administration's choice of envoy. Um, Andrew Natsios is, a, is a, a, a very good man. It's not that. But he uh, has almost no standing with the Sudanese government. And unfortunately, with no states in the UN willing to really play the stick, somebody's going to have to go in who can um, seduce and who can charm and then use the u unity, newfound unity, if we can get it, of the international community um, and the willingness of people to put peacekeepers on the ground as a kind of a limp stick, or as they used to say in the 90s, a wet noodle. You know, yeah, talks big and carries a wet noodle. Um, but unfortunately, these are the, uh, uh, I mean, they're all bad options. It's just like Iraq. None of them um, are going to bring about the immediate civilian protection that are needed, but this is the slow work of diplomacy in the shadow of Iraq. We have a, a number of questions that I'm, I'm not going to add comments, really, more than questions that show the emotional response when you talk about genocide and how people feel. Uh, one on, uh, uh, do you think that Israel's recent attack on Lebanon was disproportionate? Uh, who can officially decide disproportionate responses that kill a lot of people? Palestinian uh, groups that conduct suicide bombings within Israel. On the Armenian-Turkish question, France, Germany, and other countries in Europe have recognized the genocide. Do you think the U.S. ever will? Do you believe Turkey will accept its past and officially recognize it? <laughs> and a comment from a professor saying that, uh, the, the, disputing the, the, the statements uh, that the facts on the ground on the uh, Armenian genocide where is the scholarly evidence and who speaks for the Kurds, the Turks, and the Azeris? To give you a flavor of what is out in the audience. Right. <laughs> and Can I, I choose? just wanted, in all deference to the audience, I wanted to make sure that we yeah. got this, but I know it's. it's uh, but there is one thing, a very interesting question here. These are all very legitimate questions. We just don't have time to really get into all of this, but. Uh, a very interesting question. Uh, any thoughts on how the ethnic shift in America may change the attitude toward genocide, specifically the rise of Hispanic culture hmm. and the atrocities in Central and South America? Have you thought of that? Um, well, a lot of those are, are, are great questions. Um, I'd love to maybe um, take the Lebanon one as well, because I think that's mm -hmm. a very important question. No, please comment on whatever you I just yeah, yeah, yeah. so much. Um, but on, on specifically on the on the demographic, um, I don't know. Somebody was saying today. I don't know, we have Mark Hannes here with us, who's the head of the Gen Genocide Intervention Network, which is a um, <clears throat> was initially a, a student network um, that grew up in 1994 or in 2004 around the 10 year anniversary of the Rwandan genocide, on the logic that if uh, the genocidaire in Rwanda could kill uh, a million people in a hundred days. Mark and a group of Swarthmore students could surely raise a million dollars uh, in a hundred days and try to support civilian protection efforts in Darfur. Um, and it's an amazing movement. It's grown uh, beyond that now, and the effort that Mark is making, along with a huge number of young people, an increasing number of old people too, <laughs> um, is um, to build an, a permanent anti-genocide constituency uh, in this country um, so that we don't have to make it up as we go along every time. Um, that there's actually a group of people who, who you know, like yourselves, who say, you know, if we're going to show up at a lecture and listen to power drone on, um, you know, why don't we actually get on a list where, you know, we can do the the small thing and teaming up with our neighbors and maybe end up doing the big thing. 
Um, so I mention this now because the, I think the question is a, is a great one, and one of the one of the um, <coughs> the features of the constituency so far, I think, is that it is. Um, not very well populated by either Hispanic Americans or African Americans. And somebody was saying this earlier and I, at the event I did earlier with high school students, but, um, <clears throat> you know, that, I mean, this is a simplification, but that, that you know, um, with the immigration debates in this country um, and the familial connections that many Hispanic Americans have with people, um, you know, outside, inside, et cetera, that they have enough to worry about. African Americans, needless to say, also have enough to worry about, but, but, but that, that attitude is that it's a sort of bridge too far, you know, to begin worrying <coughs> about um, crimes and injustice uh, elsewhere when there's so much to solve here. And I don't have to tell people in Houston after Katrina um, how much has to be solved uh, here. So I'm not sure. I mean, I, I'm a, I'm a, the, the, the important feature of the constituency as it exists now is that, um, I would say, I don't know, Mark, if you would agree with this, but it is probably disproportionately filled with people who have strong ethnic heritages, um, whether that's, um, Mark, is whether you Ecuador or Uruguay, Ecuador, um, you know, I'm Irish, <laughs> I don't know if that matters, it probably doesn't count, um, but a lot of Jewish Americans, um, uh, I, I often said after a problem from hell that one of the structural problems in our in democracy is that uh, the vocal constituencies uh, get created by genocide. So the Armenian community is incredibly vocal now on Azerbaijan and on the recognition question. Um, but of course, at the time of genocide, you needed somebody other than the Armenians to be looking out for Armenians who were being killed. The same, of course, of the Jewish community in this country. Many, many wa you know, waves of immigration in the wake of the Holocaust. Even the Cambodian community has much more political clout now uh, of course, than it would have uh, between 1975 and 1979 when the Khmer Rouge um, were at their most brutal. So I, I hold out hope, I guess, in the medium to long term. But I think, I mean, part of what Mark is also working on through the Genocide Intervention Network is education. And right now, um, Holocaust education is, uh, you know, a standard staple in um, classrooms, I think, across America. I'm not sure how many exceptions there are to that. I think it's it's pretty uh, regimented um, by the states, uh, but that hasn't been expanded to encompass contemporary cases or other cases or our own case, you know, of, of na the treatment of the Native Americans, which may be a prerequisite to any long-term um, constituency is, is, is seeing ourselves as implicated in a way in the long narrative of how these crimes happen and, and are allowed. So I think it's a great question, and, and that absence of a constituency that affiliated with Central America and South America, I think, does explain, uh, in part anyway, how uh, those abuses, um, you know, how you just didn't have that, that vocal minority, that the, the squeaky wheel drawing um, uh, the attention of legislators appropriately in a timely fashion to what was going on in Guatemala in particular. Um, anyway, just a word about Lebanon because I think it's a, a really important question. I mean, the, the, and no, no one in their right mind volunteers, by the way, to answer a Lebanon-Israel question. I don't know what I'm thinking. Um, okay. But uh, just I, when I've everyone doing, was agreeing. I've been doing it all my life. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> just when everybody was sort of, it's sort of uncontroversial to be against genocide, but, but you're definitely going to lose friends now. Um, but no, the, the, I mean, the, the, the trick uh, on all of this is uh, twofold. I mean, one is what, what, are, what, are the, what are the moral and legal claims? What are the moral and legal issues with regard to the Lebanese uh, attacks on northern Israel and to the Israeli response? Um, I mean, there's no question just as a, as a factual matter that the, I mean, in terms of the hardware employed and the damage done and the casualty counts, that the response was disproportionate. Now, but there's a political case that you will hear um, people who, who believe that that was the right response make, which is that disproportionate response is the way to deter, you know, and that ultimately you can't find a needle in the haystack, uh, especially when um, Hezbollah is hiding, you know, in, in civilian communities and the way to get at Hezbollah is, unfortunately, you have to, 
whatever the expression is, break eggs to make omelet. Um, I've actually heard people make that argument. Um, but so I think it was disproportionate. I think a response was totally justified in light of uh, the mounting incursions uh, in northern Israel. But I move very quickly to the second category, um, which is, is it in your own interest? And that to me is where the disproportionate response um, uh, really, uh, to me, falls flat and resembles uh, the U.S. effort also in, in fighting terrorism. I mean, we, a lot of, we're all going to have to adjust uh, to the, the, these new threats. We, we live in a statist world. You know, the tools uh, that, that people in the Foreign Service have, um, you know, acquired, have polished, have worked with over the years are tools of statecraft, note the word state, <laughs> state on state tools. And so in the old days, when someone whacks you from one country, you know, and you're responding, you respond against the other country. But when you, when you meet these asymmetric threats, you know, these wily um, single individuals or groups of individuals, these networks, with the blunt instrument of military force in the way that the Israelis did um, all the way up to Beirut, not just in southern Lebanon, um, which, what happens, we know as an empirical matter, is that the number of people who are willing to die for their cause increases proportional to your disproportion. So just on consequentialist grounds, one has to be very, very careful um, about uh, effects. And I don't think in the United States that we have thought nearly enough. You know, we're busy looking out for our security. And if, if holding people in Guantanamo or holding them offshore or freeing our interrogators to use practices that we might not have thought we needed to use uh, over the course of the Cold War, but now we feel are necessary, that may feel appropriate in the moment. Um, but how many more people are now out you know, uh, to get the U.S. or to get Americans abroad or American institutions abroad as a result of our deviance, um, you know, from a, a set of what had been internationally accepted norms. So I think just a greater degree of consequentialism um, would temper that impulse. I mean, a response was necessary. It, as soon as you say, well, it was disproportionate, the answer then is, well, what would you have done? I mean, it's an excruciating um, uh, issue uh, once it has risen to that level. And I think part of the problem with our politics right now is on everything from Katrina to 9-11 to the Israeli response to Lebanon is um, the world starts paying attention when the, when the missiles start flying. You know, the real question is when those weapons were being stockpiled, where was the engagement with Syria? Where is the engagement today with Iran, you know, when it comes to trying somehow to deal with the open border with Iraq? Are we bringing our entire diplomatic arsenal to bear and creating processes that may seem hopeless, but, um, you know, as hopeless as they, as they may be, something may turn up. And the one thing we know for sure is that that kind of hard power military response is ushering in, you know, more generations of, of violence and cycles of violence, um, and, and it's just getting harder and not easier to deal with with, with time. So, fortunately, I can't ask you all the questions we have here, but I think you've answered some, uh, many of them. And one extrapolation of what you said is, how do we get the voters to elevate the issue of genocide to that of abortion, illegal immigration? And you've you've hit on that. But one from the young students we have here, how, how may we mobilize a young generation of students to be proactive about the crises present today? And what sources, publications, organizations keep you abreast of foreign policy issues? And how does one stay current? I'm gonna answer that question in closing. <laughs> I know what Samantha will say, you go to Harvard and Yale. <laughs> I say you come to Rice and the Baker Institute and keep current. <laughs> Samantha, thank you very much My for pleasure. an extraordinary presentation thank and you. thank you very much for coming. Thank you.